Hello, my name is Olga Sherman. I'm a senior engineer and manager at Superosum, and my job is to look after the platform team. Superosum is a ticket check company. We're building a safer internet for the next generation, meaning we're building products that make sure that when kids and teenagers go on the internet, the content and see is actually safe for them. This talk is about our journey to building a super awesome platform and specifically about the problem of platform adoption. So what can we do? What, what can we do to make sure users actually adopt our platform? Just like with any other product, we have to address the three concerns. We have to make it attractive, affordable, and accessible, which means it has to bring value to our users. They have to see it as burning value. It has to be affordable in terms of cognitive load because we want to make our engineers' lives easier rather than harder. And it has to be accessible when it has to cover enough use cases to be useful to most people. Let's start from the start. In the early days, our company was small, our team was small, and it was very easy for us to know exactly what our users wanted because we were very close to them. We used to attend every stand-up. We used to participate in every design decision. If there was a big launch, members of our team would join the product team and do whatever needed to get done to make the launch possible. In other words, we were acting as a DevOps consultancy and it worked very well. It worked very well. It was exactly what the company needed at the time. The problem is, as the company grew, this approach just couldn't scale. We found ourselves being a bottleneck for most product teams. So we sat down and came up with a new mission. This is the mission for our team as it stands right now, and that is to provide training and tooling to enable support engineers to provision and run infrastructure independently. In other words, we committed to building a platform. Uh, our first take on that was really quite simple. We felt we know DevOps very well, we know infrastructure very well, we know exactly what our users want. So we can just go ahead and build it and then tell them to use it. Uh, the approach had variable success and the biggest problem with that was that the biggest risk, the value risk, was pushed all the way to the end. In other words, we had to invest lots and lots of time in doing research and development before we even knew if the users would adopt it. Uh, one project that springs to mind was called The Matrix. Uh, we set off to solve the problem of service discovery. So we spent several weeks thinking what it is we would want to know about our services, what it is our new journalists would want to about our services. And we came up with a lot of stuff, starting with how it was deployed to technologies it was using, coding patterns, uh, what testing was implemented there. And when we put it all in a spreadsheet um, with hundreds of columns in it, and then we gave it to the product teams and asked them to fill it in. As you can imagine, they were not terribly thrilled about filling in a massive spreadsheet. And we realized that the time we invested in research and creation of that was wasted. So our next iteration was to look at it from the user's perspective. We literally issued the user survey where we asked people to propose a solution that would bring most value to their team, explain what problems it would solve for them, and invited everybody to comment on that. That generated a lot of ideas. Some of them were useful, but most of them would only be valuable to one team, the one that proposed it. But then something interesting happened in the comments section. Um, it helped to surface common problems for our teams. In fact, the comment section was probably the best part of that survey. And that's how we graduated to our current iteration to requests for comments, RFCs. Uh, RFCs are a document, documents that are produced by our team, and they start from the problem perspective. So we state the problem statement, we state the goals, and we least use cases we would like to cover with that. Only then, only then we would go on to list solutions and seek feedback from our users, invite them to comment. If the problem seems viable and the use cases seem comprehensive, then we would proceed 
to do research and eventually development of the solution candidates. Uh, the important part here is that we seek feedback every step of the way. Uh, so we know as we go along if the project is still viable. One example of that is a recent RFC on uh, secret bush prevention. We set off to put something in place to help people avoid pushing their secrets to GitHub. Uh, of course, pushing secrets to GitHub is very disruptive because then we have to rotate them. It takes a lot of time and breaks a lot of things. So we really want to do something to prevent that. Uh, we published the RFC and proceeded with the development of the solution. It seemed like a really viable problem, a problem that most people wanted to solve. And a couple of weeks later, one of the product teams noted that GitHub has already solved it. And all we need to do is click a button. Uh, just click a button and a lot of secrets wouldn't make it to GitHub. Just like that, we managed to save ourselves weeks of development time. Uh, there is a link to the template for the RFC in the slide, and I'll publish it in Platform Engineer and Slack after the talk as well. So what else can we do? What else can we do to enable adoption? Of course, even the most valuable project, just like we've seen with the metrics, will not be adopted if the cost of adoption is too high. In order to address that, we have to consider the usability risk right from the start. Uh, when we are evaluating solution candidates, we have to think whether we would be able to automate them, whether users would have to do a lot of manual things to get them to work. Um, of course, the holy grail is zero effort adoption, which means we want to automate everything we can and we want to minimize the number of interfaces we provide to our users as well. Uh, for example, uh, we were able to introduce code vulnerability scanning at almost no effort to the users at all. We just built that into our deployment pipelines. So the only thing users needed to do is to create an account with our vulnerability scanning tool. The other aspect of it is the need to look after our users. Our team is very small in comparison to the size of the company, and we rely a lot on self-service tools. First, of course, is self-service documentation. We document everything we release, and we're very serious about it. We treat it as a deliverable. Uh, we have a staging area and production area for documentation. It always gets reviewed before it's pushed to production. Uh, is structured to help our users to understand what sort of documentation this is, whether it's a reference guide, whether it's a how-to guide, an introduction to the new technology. Uh, we deliver it through several mediums. One is on Confluence. That's where most of the documentation lives for our company, but also through GitHub. Uh, we have something called Quick Start Service or Sample Application. It's an application that can be deployed at the click of a button and provides our users with all the basics of the platform, such as deployment pipelines, some basic infrastructure, and it's very well documented. So the users can click a button, deploy a service, see how it works, and read how it works right there and then in the GitHub repo. Uh, there is another idea that we've been playing around with, and that's a CLI interface, the holy grail of user interfaces. Uh, something that would allow us to have just one interface to our users and to be able to deliver all the tools we have created and all the documentation we have created at the click of a button directly from their command line. Of course, Self-service can only take you so far, and it's also necessary to provide life support and help them uh, debug issues they're dealing with or help them understand how to use our product. In the early days, we tried to be everything to everyone. We tried to help every single person within the company with any technical question, and it was overwhelming. 
now we created a little bit more structure to support. We segregate support into different query types. We separate onboarding queries, that is new joiners trying to understand how to use our systems. Uh, something is broken queries. They have the highest SLAs and there is always somebody on call dedicated to looking after that. And consulting requests. Consulting requests are less urgent. So the SLAs there are uh, not quite as strict, but they need to go to more senior people. So there is a separate channel for them. Uh, the final aspect of user adoption is the unknown unknown. We need to understand if we are covering enough cases to be useful to most teams. And of course, the only way to go about it is to actually ask the users. Uh, we issue user questionnaire on a regular basis and we ask questions about their workflows. Uh, we ask them how long does it take them to put a small change into production? How long does it take them to create a new service? Trying to understand if there are any outliers, trying to understand if for some teams, we are not doing enough, we're not taking into account some of the things they have to deal with. Uh, we also found that Forms are really good in terms of gathering high volume of feedback, but in order to understand and make sense of that feedback, we also need to talk to our users. So we complement the forms with interactive sessions where we ask them open questions along the lines of, is there any plans in the future that we need to be aware of? Is there anything we can do to help them be more efficient in their jobs? And of course, ask clarifying questions about the answers in the feedback forums. All right, this is it. I hope you enjoyed my talk. I hope you're interested in this area. Uh, if you are, we, have, we are actually hiring a, a technical product manager. Please feel free to contact me on Slack after this or find me on LinkedIn. I'll be available in Platform Stories channel to answer any questions after this talk. Thank you very much for your time.